Good morning, class. How are you today? We do welcome everyone here today and those that are watching online also. We actually have a quite a few that watch online. And more than I thought, uh, through the week, people that don't see it on Sunday, they key back in. We have actually a lot that watch it online. We welcome you here today uh, also. It's our goal that we will jump into the Word of God here and try to discover why some people think this book is so special. I... Uh, because there are many that think that it's a special book, you know, and uh, that it's alive and it's special and it's a mystical, truthful book. And we can say all those things, but this morning let's jump in here and let's see if it's true, if it uh, jumps out at us, if it comes alive to us. We can say all those things, but it's another f for the transaction to take place. Amen. So as we seek this transaction this morning, I, uh, we're, the hope is that we're all challenged today in the Word of God and in the Scriptures uh, to be more like Christ, to learn more about His Word, His will, and His way. And to learn about Him means that we're ready to receive from Him, that it might affect our lives. Now, as I teach, kind of our one rule here is, I'll teach, but you have to be a Berean. It's up to you to study out these things that I'm saying, to see if they're true or not. That's your responsibility. My responsibility is to bring it as I see it. And so as we look at that, let's uh, jump into my first quote of this morning. Well, this is Lesson 29, Chapter 5. There again, somebody asked me the other day, how do you get 29 lessons out of five chapters? I'm not really sure, but we did pull it off somehow. This is uh, Francis of Assisi. It is no use walking anywhere to preach unless our walking is our preaching. St. Francis. That says a lot, doesn't it? And it's uh, amazing how human nature thinks <clears throat> that we're to carry a message to a destination. I'm not saying we're not supposed to. But there's more people watching us walk to that destination than it's probably in the congregant or the congregation of those <laughs> that we're taking the message to. Now, as we start here in the book of Acts again, and I need to opening, open this teaching here uh, this morning with a little preface, and I, that is I'm standing before you with uh, one gravy biscuit and gravy scrambled eggs. So I'm a, uh, usually I don't eat before I come in here, but I love a good gravy biscuit. So you'll have to allow for that this morning, that I am under the influence of a gravy biscuit. Uh, so I'll be leaning on the pulpit a lot. Here we start off with the second persecution again. This is where we actually left off uh, last week, talking about the early church and what happened with the early church and how the Holy Spirit, of course, was poured out in Acts 2. Here you have the believers. Jesus is gone. Jesus says, I'm going to send you my spirit. This was, was an incredible day. We are still living in that day of the outpouring of the spirit. But yet I find myself not excited enough about that topic. As a Christian and as a believer, I've been sent a helper, and that helper is Jesus Christ himself. Jesus walked upon the earth at one time, but now he walks upon the earth through us. And I can say those words, but I'm not sure they fully drop from here to here because the excitement of the encountering of the Holy Spirit, uh, that excitement, that anticipation uh, should be in the forefront of at least uh, of our thinking. So we're going to pick up here in Acts 5 and verse 17. And, this, and there again, the reason I, I'll bring to your attention, I'm putting up these slides, and I'll say Acts 5, 17 through 28. And the reason I do that is to show you the contextual verses. This is the context. 
in which these next verses will be will discover the truth. So here's the next set of contextual verses that we're going into and look into uh, to find out the truth of what God's saying to us. And so we call we'll call this the second persecution, Acts five seventeen through twenty eight, and it says in Acts chapter five verse seventeen. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which was a set of the Sadducees, and uh, they were filled with uh, indignation. In other words, they were very upset here. When Jesus walked the earth, now listen to this one, try to, I mention it several times, several different ways to get it. Repetitiveness is what creates stored memory. So I will repeat myself in different ways, different forms. When Jesus walked the earth, the Pharisees were in power of the Sanhedrin. Uh, there again, the Sanhedrin was the governing sect. So we had the, 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 the Pharisees were in charge of uh, the Sanhedrin. In the book of Acts, the Sadducees were considered the liberals, uh, were now in control of the Sanhedrin. So you had the Pharisees, or more of the conservative crowd, was in charge of the Sanhedrin when Jesus walked the earth. Jesus is gone, resurrection. Now we have a shifting of the Sanhedrin uh, more uh, into the liberal side. It would be like our government having a, uh, what we say is the Republicans versus uh, uh, the Democrats. So that's kind of, a, you're saying one's liberal and one's conservative. Same thing with the Sadducees uh, there and the, and the Pharisees. <clears throat> then you had the Sanhedrin, which was basically the governing body, which could be made up of both, but you would tend to have one over the other uh, in a majority situation. The Sanhedrin was a Jewish court of law and uh, legislative assembly that existed in ancient Israel from around the 2nd century B.C. until 425. The term Sanhedrin comes from a Greek word meaning council or assembly. Now the Pharisees who led in the persecution against Jesus uh, were against Jesus, but it is the Sadducees who led the persecution against the early church. So kind of, kind of get that in your mind, what's happened there. you got the Pharisees pre-cross, Sadducees, uh, post crawl. So you got more of a liberal view in the time we are in now in the book of Acts. Uh, the healings <clears throat> were an embarrassment to them as they denied the supernatural. Now the liberals or there or the Sadducees denied the supernatural. Now today even we see the same thing in the liberal movements of our country. In other words, that's the reason uh, when a liberal ideology takes over particular churches, uh, what happens is you, that's more of a liberal mindset. And the liberal mindset says, come as you are, we accept you as you are. The more conservative mindset says, come as you are and allow Jesus to change who you are. But a liberal mind says, no, you're accepted like you are. But that's not the idea of coming to Christ. The idea of coming to Christ is uh, that we don't stay. Uh, and my hope in, uh, is in raising my children was they would meet the Jesus in me before they met me, before they met truly who I was, that they could meet the Christ in me. But you want to start getting those things in your head so that it's just automatic recall of uh, the Pharisees pre Sadducees post, and the Sadducees here, there again through the book of Acts, we do not see, we don't have an account of any Sadducee that was converted. Doesn't mean there weren't some converted. But we don't have record of any of the liberal crowd being converted. It was more, uh, and, and I'll show a few of these conversions here in just a moment. <clears throat> so we call, call this the second persecution again in verse 18. And <clears throat> they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in common prison. So they were preaching. They had these uh, the Sadducees came together, called together some of uh, the leaders, and they decided to put them in prison. <clears throat> but the angel of the Lord, now I put in parentheses there, an, an angel. 
I am a King James guy, uh, and the King James says, but the angel of the Lord, which is totally appropriate. But a lot of times when we see the angel, we think of maybe it's Jesus. Could it be Jesus or not? It just so happens here we know uh, in the context that it is really an, uh, you could, it's more understanding in English than Greek that an angel would mean not Jesus because a lot of times we just associate the angel as Christ. Here that wasn't the case. So I'll put, uh, but the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, go stand and speak in the temple to uh, all the words of this life. And when they heard that, uh, they entered into the temples early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came and they that were with him and called the council together. So here they call the council together. And all the senate of the children of Israel, that's a pretty, pretty high up crowd here, and sent to the prison to have them brought, not knowing they were already gone. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety, and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man uh, within. So something happened there. It just so happens that an angel had intervened. There again, I'll have people say to me, well, Alan, I don't believe angels are operating today. I said, well, we got a problem. Right. Houston, we got a problem. We got an example in Acts. This is in the early part of the church where we had angelic activity at what I would call a pretty high level. Now, I, I, you know, we could say, well, just test it. Go get yourself in prison, see if it works. I mean, you know, you, you could try that. But, but, but you need to be innocent when it happens. That's a little, that's a, that's a little, uh, a little something you need to stick in there. Uh, this was a debtor's prison that they were put into. That someone must pay the debt in full for you to be released. Uh, this was an illusion of what Jesus was doing or is doing for us. Debtor's prison, if you owed money, you'd have to go to serve so much time in prison. You were released. And now the problem here was that if you were the jailer there, if someone escaped and they lacked two years in their sentence, you had to fill it. And that's the reason on other occasions they were almost wanted to pull her sword out. You remember with Peter, and they'd rather kill themselves as to, as to do that. And they encouraged them not to do that. So let's go on to verse 24. And when the high priest... And the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things. They doubted of them whereunto this would grow. Now, look, take note. This is the big guys. This is like getting the president and vice president and, and, and whoever. Because, so when you read it, it says, And when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, this is the big guys. They doubted of them whereunto this would grow. They're saying, oh, no. This, if they find out, this story is going to get bigger and bigger. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and are teaching the people. Wow. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people uh, lest they should have been stoned. And so they went ahead and got them, and brought them back to the council, but they didn't do it with a big stink because they had a crowd of people and they were listening to this gospel message that Peter was preaching, which that message was to the Jewish nation, you have killed the Messiah, repent, and he'll come again. <clears throat> so it says in verse 27, when they brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest uh, asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in, his, in this name? Now, that, to me, that is so interesting. It wasn't don't teach. It's don't teach in his name. So, so that tells us something. New Testament church, there is some spiritual significance there's some spiritual authority 
when we use his name and we invoke it into any set of circumstances. There's something about calling upon his name that is an issue. He said, you can go preach, don't use, just don't use his name. I don't guess they heard of pronouns back then. No, that's another subject. Okay. <clears throat> so, they went on here and said, the, the, uh, then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest and asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in his name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now that's, I mean, uh, what they're actually, what I want you to see here is they actually gave a progress report on Peter. Now here they were in prison, they came out and they're preaching again in this gospel of this man Jesus. You see, here's what they said. Ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. Now would be unto God we could be condemned of that in Alexander County you know, Taylorsville. <laughs> right? I mean, not only that, they were basically their enemy. So basically their enemy gave a progress report on them. Isn't that something? I mean, wouldn't it be nice if all the pagans of Alexander County said, well, they've about converted the whole county up there at that New Life Church. In other words, in other words the enemy would given that, be given that report on us. I mean, just think about it. I mean, it makes for a nice little statement. But just think about what that means. That's a very active group of people, wouldn't you say? If the enemy of the county gave a progress report upon New Life Church like that, to me it's just, we got a ways to go. That's all. Now, so this progress report, uh, he says, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. Uh, to me that's just an incredible statement. Now, as we move on into this next set of, of Scripture, uh, we'll move into verses in chapter 5, and you can move into verse uh, 29 uh, through 33. So, in the previous context, we had the second persecution. So, now as we go into the context of this next set of Scripture... It's going to be the answer of the apostles to that second persecution. All right? So let's look at it. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, here's their answer, we ought to obey God rather than men. Wow. It just so happens it'll be hard to apply that to us today, right? Not really. Now, whether you know it or not, this is exactly where what we're walking into today. Now, we also know that God has placed leadership into leadership. We know we have Scripture that we're to follow our leaders. But here we see that it's not necessarily that we're to follow the leaders that are over the land to a T, where they violate God and His Word. We are instructed to follow that. And that's what Peter and them were alluding to here. Can you see that? So they had to make a choice. They were in prison. Angel came and let them out of prison. Their response was, we ought to obey God rather than men. And the reason I think we need to consider that, you're going to, be fi you're going to find that we are going to, unless things change and there's a great revival, you're going to find that this, we're going to be pressured more. That's going to be our pressure point moving forward. Um, the reason I appreciated the teaching Trevor's bringing uh, because it, it 
it lends unto this uh, thought, uh, this dilemma, I might say, uh, that we're going to be finding ourselves into more and more and more. Already many have fallen to this. So you can't say we're not there because many have compromised uh, with this wokeness and this political correctness now. And political correctness and wokeness is requirements of laws that have not been written. It's just, it's, they're not been written. It's behavioral patterns that people are putting on other people, but it's not the law of the land. I had a, actually had an official come by and inspected my farm, one of many inspectors. We have so many now, I do ask them to give me their credentials because there's so many today. And so we had one two weeks ago, came in and said, okay, you're violating this, 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 and this. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, I have license and I have fulfilled every requirement by the state and federal law. What you are trying to impose upon me is not state or federal law. And they have issued my license and permits to milk cows. Yes, but this is how we're interpreting those laws. I said, no. Now, I was speaking with somebody that had the authority to, 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 to cut, cut off. They couldn't pull my license, but they could make a big stink for me. And I had to say, I am fulfilling the federal law and the state law. Your laws are not written laws. You're imposing on, well, it'll make our milk company look better. You think I'm kidding, I'm serious. Well, you'll make our milk company look better. Now, this person had been out of college maybe two years, I don't know, three, whatever. Right, never, I'm surprised I even knew which end of the cow you get milk from. <laughs> to put it politely. Uh, but, but what we have to be careful of are imposed laws that are not state and federal law. Now you got to, the best place to do this is in the churches. Is to impose things, number one, state and federal government's not imposing, and number two, what the Word of God's not imposing. Matter of fact, it'll be contrary to the Word of God. So we're going to have to, we're going to run into this uh, constantly. It's like I say, Trevor will be, I'm sure, hitting on this some today. <clears throat> we are confronted this day with this same question. We ought to obey God rather than man. Will we obey God rather than men? To be a biblical Christian will become more and more unpopular. Oh, you're with me. Now, if you're doing this to be popular, you choose the wrong in religion. That's all. Now, Acts 5.30 says this, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Now, Peter just bless his little heart. It seems like every time he gets an opportunity, he's going to fuss at Israel for killing Jesus. That's all I can say. <coughs> There's not a time that Jesus doesn't get a platform what he doesn't make that statement in that in the book of Acts. So that's his message. Because he was wanting to usher in the second coming of Christ. So his job was to convert Israel. Repent, you've killed the king. That was his message. And don't read other stuff into it because that was his message. And he was being true unto his message. Even to the point, every time he got up and spoke, I'm sure they were saying, oh, no, there's Peter again. Would he quit condemning us? <clears throat> so he says this again in Acts 5.30. Here we see Peter taking advantage once again to preach the murder indictment to the nation of Israel, hoping to, for repentance of the nation. Now, this is where we get a lot of our... Uh, Peter was preaching this message to the nation of Israel. This is where a lot of the anti-Semitic type thinking comes from. Uh, now, now keep that in mind, this statement, Peter's always preaching a murder indictment. 
So what happened was in Catholicism, early years of even the church, we had arise what's called replacement theology. You've heard me talk about it. And that is, it goes along with this message. You killed the king, you killed the king. Israel never repented. So the Pope said, well, the church, since Israel didn't repent, the church is supposed to replace Israel. Nah, that's right. That's, that's, that, but that's how you come up with it. Well, Peter said you, you killed the king, you never repented. So therefore, the church has surely replaced Israel because we have accepted him. But there, but there is a difference, and we want to see that difference here as we move forward. Peter never mentions Jesus Christ without blaming them for the crucifixion. This is true. This is in Scripture. But I'm not Peter, and you're not either. Peter was commissioned with that message. We today preach unto Israel that Jesus is the Messiah. That's what we preach to Israel. Yet Jesus is your Messiah. He's your King, and He is our Savior. So today, you don't have a... Uh, we know that today there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's something called a one new man. That's not in prophecy, by the way. That was new information brought on by the Apostle Paul. He said... He gave us this understanding of the bride of Christ, that we are the church. We are what's called the bride of Christ, right? We're waiting for the marriage supper of the Lamb. I had some discussions this past week on how, and y'all have heard me teach it, how if we're the bride of Christ, and people today believe that the church goes through the tribulation period, and then we go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And you've heard me say this before. If, if Jesus is our groom, why in the world would you beat your wife for seven years and then say, come on up, let's get married? I thought, that just, just doesn't, and, and that's not the biblical, it's, it's not the biblical, biblical symbolism either. If you take the Jewish wedding, you have exactly what's happening at the rapture of the church. And so, you, you do have the rapture of the church. And most everybody in replacement theology or covenant theology or whatever th theology you got, most people agree that in the seven-year tribulation period that the Holy Spirit will be taken out of here. It will be gone. And so, therefore, during that seven years, you have to endure, Jesus said it in his scriptures about trib, you have to endure to the end to be saved. That's a quote from Scripture. It's in Matthew. You have to endure to the end to be, endure, what? You must endure to the end, which is the tribulation period, what he was referring to. You got to endure to the end of that. It means you cannot take the mark of the beast, which we all know if you don't take it, most people will be martyred. There will be some that will possibly live through it. But nonetheless, you do not take, because Jesus is going to protect a, a remnant. But you're not to take the mark of the beast in the tribulation period. Or, you see, where people get into losing your salvation is that if you take the mark of the beast, you're not saved anymore. But, okay. But what's the truth is, you don't get your, your salvation until the end of the tribulation. You're enduring and then you receive. Today we receive and we endure. Can you see a difference? I'm talking about both sets, actually. I just said there's a people that has to endure to the end, and at the end of that, if they do not take the mark of the beast, then their salvation is at the end. Because the Scripture says you have to endure to the end. You're not saved at the beginning. You have to endure to be saved. And that's how some people come up with the doctrine is you're not saved until the end. Well, I mean, I get it. It's just you're not putting it in the book at the right place. That's the reason it's very important to understand the chronological order of the revelations. So that's my point. 
So, if the Holy Spirit's not here in tribulation, when did it leave? Well, where is the Holy Spirit today? It's in us. It's in us. So the Holy Spirit, that's, that's part of the rapture of the church. The Holy Spirit's taken out. So we have to go out before then. Or the Holy Spirit will still be here. They will not be indwelt with the Holy Spirit in tribulation period. It's just, it's just Bible. So as we see how the, how it, why it's important to understand chronologically how the revelations unfold with truth, it's very important or you're going to mess around and get your grace in the tribulation and your tribulation and your grace. And it just doesn't mix. It, it, it turns into a, a non-truth. <clears throat> okay, now that I've got you totally confused. What, what we see here is Peter's preaching this message to stay in order that you killed the king. Uh, Ephesians 3 and 4, if you'll repent of killing the king, God is going to send him again to the earth. So Peter's message was that Jesus, if you'll repent Israel from killing the king and receive him as your Messiah, God's going to send him again, which we now historically know has yet to happen, right? But we know that it's going to happen, right? Because there will be a time that the nation of Israel will receive him as king. They're just, the Bible just says it will, you know. We maybe don't know what to do with it all the time, but that's just what it says. <clears throat> okay, keep all that in mind. There again, I can talk like this because it's you're required to study the scriptures to see what I'm saying is true or not. Now, here's the answer, another answer of the apostles in verse 31. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Peter once again calls the nation Israel. This same message is being offered to Israel even today. Same message. Okay, all right, let's go to verse 32. And we are his witnesses of those things, so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Now, there's a little something here I want us to look at. There's, I am of the persuasion, I wouldn't die for it, but I'm just under the persuasion that there's multiple fillings of the Holy Spirit. Now, I go on record in saying I believe in being baptized in the Spirit. Totally believe in that. The Scripture said, I'm going to show it to you here in a minute. Totally believe that. But it doesn't limit it, limit it to one time. And I'm glad because my first time ran out and I needed to get a refill. You might know what I'm, what I'm talking about. So, and, and I've experienced uh, uh, refills. But here he's, he mentions this fact, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. So I know that there is some type of filling of the Holy Spirit that comes through obedience. Everybody see that? Now, I didn't say all fillings come through obedience. It's obvious that some fillings come through the grace of God just because he says, Alan, you ain't making it. I'm going to have to give you a shot here or something. You just can't seem to get over this one. So I believe that God can give us a filling of his Spirit because he just deems it necessary. But if you want more than what you got, there's also, by Scripture, it shows us that God gives a filling of His Spirit out of obedience. It, it, here's an example. I've heard people say, well, you, don't, you, not, you, you can't get the Holy Ghost by obedience. I said, well, it's, I got a situation you need to deal with. So when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and they took counsel to slay Him. Wow. That, <laughs> That wasn't the right cut of the heart response, was it? I mean, repentance would have been sufficient. Uh, but anyway, so they took heart uh, to slay them. Being a witness does not mean that you will win them over. Can somebody say amen or oh me or something? We are to witness, but we don't have a guarantee uh, that we're going to win them over. So that's an example of that. Uh, so is the Holy Ghost. There it is, whom God hath given to them that obey. Now here is the warning of Gamaliel. Uh, I looked that up on how to pronounce it. 
on the internet, and I heard two or three different types, so I thought I'm just going to redneck it. He's Gamelia. <laughs> That's just the way it comes out of my mouth. And, uh, but this is the, a new context here. We're going into a same, same storyline, but we're taking a different context. Someone else is entering. We've got a different group of Scripture here to reveal to us truth. And this is a warning that was given uh, by Gamaliel, and it's Acts 5, 34 through 39. Now this is a, do you remember hearing this name before? Who? It was with Paul. Paul refers to him, and I'll give you the scripture, how he said at his feet of this dude here. So we get a warning, all of a sudden Gamaliel ends up on the scene here with all this council, the Sanhedrin, all of these people come around. They're having a problem with Peter preaching the gospel. All of a sudden, the whole gospel's gotten over all of, of Jerusalem, and they said he's making a mess. So you get all these leaders together. Then all of a sudden, this man called Gamelia comes up. Well, well, who's this guy? Well, he's some great teacher because Paul refers to him as sitting at his feet, and and all that Paul learned. Now, Gamelia, as we watch these scripture. So interesting to me, this guy, because he's really considered, of all the Sanhedrin and everybody, he can pull rank and they'll listen. <laughs> That's interesting to me, because you got the Sanhedrin, you got all this, and Gamaliel walks up and says, okay, then we're going to talk. Y'all leave and y'all stay. That's what happens right here. It tickles me. <clears throat> so here we go. Here's his warning. Acts 5.34, Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had a reputation among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. What that means, he said, just set them over here just a little for a little bit. Let's get us a little breather. He was saying, I think we need to think this through a little better. So he comes on the scene. He, uh, he was a Pharisee. You remember the Pharisee? Was that conservative or liberal? More conservative. So he named Gamaliel, doctor of the law. Gamaliel wants the apostles excused so that he can talk to the Sanhedrin. Well, here's the Sanhedrin. They're the big council. Gamaliel walks up and says, okay, let's set them aside. Come on, y'all. We got to talk. So this must be a pretty influential guy. Not only is he influential, he must be smart. And number two, he must have a lot of godly wisdom. Because something in him was telling him, you're moving a little too fast here, guys. Now let's see what happens. This shows tremendous influence and respect if he can call this meeting. Gamaliel is recognized as a Pharisee doctor of the Jewish law in Acts 5. Speaks of the Gamaliel as a man held in great esteem by all Jews, and as a Jewish law teacher of the Apostle Paul. And here's the verse: I am, I am verily a man of which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city of Cilia, uh, yet brought up in the city of the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous towards God, as ye all know to this day. Now there's something going on. Gamaliel had all this knowledge; he was the great teacher. But he had something more than knowledge. There was some type of godly wisdom operating in this guy. Enough, enough wisdom. And he said, whoa, that's what we got to look. We got to relook. Hey, you big leaders, priest, Pharisee, Sadducee, Sanhedrin, hold your jets. Let's look at some of, the, of what's going on here. We see there that Paul identifies him as his teacher. Now, this is what's interesting to me. Traditions say that he embraced Christianity before his death in 70 A.D. So, so that's, that's tradition. Now, 70 A.D., Titus came through, you know, destroyed. Well, there's, tradition says that he was converted at that great destruction, or right before it, or during that time. Now, you can almost see a hint of that, because he, he was somewhat persuaded as he goes through this interrogation. You can tell he's like, now I don't know. I feel something on this, or, or, or whatever. And I so, I just so enjoy his honesty here. 
in Acts 35 and 535, and said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up, Titus, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined him, who was slain and all, and uh, many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. And what he's saying is, this guy, uh, Tudius or Titus or whatever you want to call him here, what he's saying, listen, we've had individuals rise up before. This guy had four. What he actually did, he said, let's go to the Red Sea. The God's told me I can part it again. We can walk across it. Well, guess what? Didn't happen. So he, they're saying we've had men come with big messages before. Now the point is, he says, if it's God, this is where we get uh, this test or standard from. They said, if it's God, it'll stand. And if it's not, it'll fall. Right? And I found myself that way a lot of times, and just as I know you have also. <clears throat> So he boasted himself. That's one thing that you look for. If you've got to go around and say you're a great prophet and apostle, and if you've got to boast in yourself a whole lot of who you are, you might be a redneck Thaddeus if you've got to go around bragging on who you are. Right? You're probably going to fall too. Now between 44 and 46 A.D., uh, one Th Thyatus, according to Josephus, caused an uprising with what may have been a claim to be the Messiah. And then he did the Red Sea thing and all that. That's, if you want to do a little reading on him, it's really, you'll get sidetracked. And don't do it unless you've got a lot of time. Very interesting what happened there. But his point was um, that there were guys who would rise up, get a following, but if God is behind it, it will fail. That, that was Gamaliel's uh, proof is litmus test of the Spirit. And he said, here's, here's one way that we can tell. He said, you're going to have many people rise up. And that's the reason when you have people rise up around an individual, it's almost a dangerous thing. If, if you have an individual that is constantly yielding to Jesus, you know that you're following Jesus, not that individual. But most churches, a lot of churches today, are follow, following an individual personality. As I've said before, that's not what we want to accomplish here. We want to accomplish an atmosphere where we can all follow Jesus, and He's in charge here. That's, that's the goal. Have we perfected it yet? No. Have we stumbled and fallen? Yes. But we still know where we go with. Okay? We still know where we're trying to head. So that's an example he gave. Now here's an Acts 37. After this man rose up, Judas of Galilee, in the days of taxing, and drew away much people after him, he also perished in all, even as many as obeyed him were uh, dispersed. He's just gives another example uh, of another individual that did the same thing. Now a speech by Gamaliel, a member of the Sanhedrin, identifies uh, Thydus and Judah as examples of failed Messianic movements and suggest uh, that the movement emerging in the name of Jesus of Nazareth could similarly fail unless he really was the Messiah. So he's, he's kind of leaving the door open and he's saying, if this is of God, it will not fail. It will continue. If it's not of God, it'll fail. Which we know 2,000 years later, we can give testimony, didn't fall didn't fail. Amen? So this movement is of God according to the test of the Sanhedrin there. <laughs> now let's go on to the next part of the warning. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to nothing. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. Now, you've, you've got to take this scripture, look at who we are. The church is here today, 2,000 years later, as a testimony that that was true. That is a true, we, are, we have passed this test of time that the church of Jesus Christ is the true movement of God. Now, pray tell, has the devil not tried to destroy it? But you can't. 
because it's of God. If it could have been destroyed, we all know it would have been. Right? It's down through the dark ages. I mean, it would have been. But not, this is a move of God that we have found ourselves in, and I'm happy in it. Thank you very much. I'm very happy that I'm in it, and I'm in the real one. Here we see that Gamaliel was using his wisdom. It also uh, seems that he was leaning towards the possibility that Jesus could be the Messiah. Do you kind of see that in his defense of it? You're like, this dude of full of wisdom is picking up on, I think this is the Messiah. So I could easily think that he received Jesus around 70 A.D. I don't have a bit of problem with that. But if he be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, which we know it hasn't to this day. Now, we've got just a few minutes to start the next contextual part of this uh, chapter uh, 5, and it's in uh, 5, 40 through 42. Now, this is where the apostles are beaten. Now, it's something. They just heard from Gamaliel. He just addressed them all, said, you better off to leave it alone. Here we go right into they didn't heed. Well, they partially heeded. Gamaliel said, let them alone, let them go. So you know what they did? They beat them up, and then they let them go. They thought, well, we'll just do both of them. That wasn't a wise thing to do, but that's what they did. Let's look at it. The apostles were beaten. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them, commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they beat them up and said, okay, just don't speak in the name of Jesus. Now, that's not what Gamaliel said. He said, you need to let them go. And if it's of God, it'll stand. And if it's not, it'll fall. And if you mess with them and is God, you're in trouble. That's what he was saying. So it's obvious here that they were not heeding what was considered, as far as I know, the wisest man uh, uh, of the Jews the, at that time. It seems they heard Gamaliel, but did not actually believe him. That's sad. If these men were innocent, they should have been let go. If they were guilty, they should have been kept. The problem is they beat them as guilty, and then they let them go as innocent. Now, how many times do we do that in our own life? In other words, we sin, but yet we repent. Sin and repent. I can always sin because I can always. In other words, we're guilty, but we want to be let go. Right? It's, 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 it's a mixture of the spiritual world that enters our minds. Let's do one more verse here, 5, 41, 42, and we'll finish up here, Karen. And they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were uh, counted worthy to suffer for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. They thought, well, you might beat us, but we're not going to stop preaching <laughs> Jesus Christ. Here we see they were rejoicing. That's something I'm sure we all have done when we were persecuted. Thank you, yeah. How can we be per Have you ever helped someone? Could be husband and wife, children, friends. And then when you helped them, you were condemned for it. Something about it you didn't help them right or they didn't like it. But you were doing it as serving them as of Christ. Do we rejoice because we know our heart? That's what was happening here. They were rejoicing. Right, why were they rejoicing? Because they were worthy to suffer for his name. Now watch this. The emphasis was the teaching and preaching of who this uh, person is, Jesus Christ, the gospel. That I want you to see that. This is the emphasis. The persecution was the pre it's the preaching of Jesus Christ. You, it's not preaching Jesus as a religion. It's not preaching Jesus as a, a form of doctrine or laws and rules that we keep. You've got to see this. They were preaching 
The gospel was the person, Jesus Christ. The person, Jesus Christ. It's about the person, Jesus Christ. The gospel is a person, not some rhetoric or religion. It says they cease not to teach and preach. Jesus Christ. Now, now you got to see that. And we're going to get into next week more into the, uh, the Jesus Christ is that gospel. Next week we're going to get into the preaching of Jesus Christ, the gospel, and I'm going to show you the difference in a Hellenistic Jew, a Jew. I'm, we're going to get into some different definitions and see where these different groups come together in this understanding, and it is very important as the church that we see it. You may stand. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for this day. I thank you, O oh God, for your word that you, that you have given us to follow and to read and gain understanding and wisdom. It is my prayer, Lord, that this group of believers will test everything that I've said, that they will be Bereans and they'll study the Scripture to see if these things are true. I pray, O oh God, that you'd be with us in this next hour, hour and a half, as we go into worship. Be with us, Lord Jesus. We've talked about your word. We ask and pray, Lord, that your presence would be made manifest among your people in the worship. And God's people said, Amen and amen.